Hi, everybody. We're here with a very kind and gracious guest um, that I met through my friend Chris Brogan. Um, we are here with Commander Mark Devine. Uh, Mark Devine is a New York Times bestselling author. Um, he is a Navy SEAL officer, a veteran of nine years active duty and 11 years in the reserves, combat veteran, and um, now runs an ama amazing organization called SEAL Fit that we'll talk about in a minute. But boy, if you want to talk about a person who has served our country uh, to be here with us on Memorial Day, I can't imagine anybody better than Mark Devine. Thank you so much, Mark, for being here with us. Yeah, thank you, Lee. It's my pleasure. Well, you've got an amazing resume, and, and people can find you at your website um, and, and all over the place on the Internet. And you've been a guest on many podcasts, and, and, and of course, your books um, are uh, available, and we're going to talk about all those in a moment. But tell me just briefly, if you just give us kind of a thumbnail sketch of your career and, uh, and what, you've, what you've done uh, while you were in the military. Okay, so I was uh, SEAL Team 3. I went through SEAL training in 1990. Um, and uh, from there I went to SEAL Team 3, which is in Coronado, California. SEAL Team 3 at that time deployed to East Asia. So I did uh, several back-to-back -back deployments, you know, as an assistant platoon commander, then platoon commander to, to that region. Um, and, it, you know, that was uh, really my formative, you know, experience. You know, so a lot of the countries I worked with, we did foreign internal defense missions, special reconnaissance, and a lot of training the, the trainers over there. Um, a few, you know, interesting, you know, ops that came up that, you know, we won't talk about, um, you know, but it was really pre 9-11 uh, by a long shot. And so one of the, the you know, one of the, the kind of gripping moments was us spooling up to go to Desert Storm. And of course, that that conflict, uh, you know, gracefully uh, ended quickly. We're well, not gracefully, but gratefully ended quickly. Right. And uh, we actually never went, uh, my platoon anyways. So, you know, I never saw, um, you know, sustained combat when I was on active duty that first stint. So I was at SEAL Team 3 for about five years, and then I went on to SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team, which is the, um, you know, the, the SEAL unit that manages the subsurface assets, little mini submarines that we have. It's very, very interesting. Another four months of training to learn how to pilot and navigate the little mini sub. Wow. We were, off, we were uh, stationed out of Hawaii, and... That was, uh, I found that work to be very, very cool because it was technically, you know, very challenging. Um, mentally, it was very challenging. A lot of missions were, you know, eight to 10 hours, you know, you're underwater navigating this little, you know, tin can and you're, it's wet. It's not like the abyss where you're in this nice dry submarine. It's, you're on dive status the whole time and wow. it's, uh, it's pretty intense training, pretty intense work. Um, after that, I, I got off active duty because I had gotten married. And uh, my, my wife and I, you know, hadn't really had uh, uh, the discussion about the time away from home very well, right? Right, so right. When, uh, when I went to Hawaii, you know, I was literally gone for the first, practically the first six months of our marriage. And, and it was going to get worse. You know what I mean? It was just going to get worse. And so uh, we had to come to Jesus talk and decided that, you know, had the Navy really wanted me to have a wife, they would have issued me one. And I uh, <laughs> decided to get out and uh, you know go back into the business world but stay in the reserves and so nine years uh, after you know uh, starting this thing I, I got out and stayed in the reserves and then the reserves were really interesting as well um, I did a uh, in 1999 a call up for a year spent time in uh, Africa uh, East Africa Northeast Africa um, and uh, Naval Special Warfare Group 1 down in Coronado did some really cool projects with them uh, 2004, I got called up again, this time to go to Iraq, and I was in Baghdad with SEAL Team 1 wow. and at the Joint Special Operations Task Force you know, that was conducting you know, all spec ops over there. Uh, that was really enjoyable. I had a couple uh, projects that I was working on. One was a, uh, to develop and lead the uh, certification program for the deploying squadrons, SEAL squadrons, which was kind of their final battle test, and we had developed this really uh, comprehensive, intelligence-driven role player, you know, um, you know, rich, complex scenario that was based upon the, the, what was happening on the ground in Iraq. Wow. And so they plugged in the Lily, the real intelligence, and we had, you know, role players who were playing real people that were being hunted, wow. um, bad guys. And so that was fascinating, you know, four or 500 role players. And, you know, we'd have, you know, all of that just for basically a task unit size SEAL squadron, which are couple task units out there and, and um, so maybe 100 guys 
doing the training. So that was cool. And then in Iraq, I was um, responsible for the the Navy's side of the study on whether the Marine Corps would be admitted to special operations. So there was a proof of concept being done, and um, there was a, a 100-man Marine unit put together called the SOCOM DET, SOCOM DET-1, and they were hand-picked kind of recon and intelligence guys. And uh, but they were assigned to SEAL Team One, and um, they, you know, the the Marine Corps had hired a, a Center for Naval Analysis, I think, to do a test or do a study, and um, we were going to do a study, and so they br- they brought me in to lead it. That was their answer. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, I guess uh, at the time I was getting my doctorate at University of San Diego, and they said, well, you know, here's a, a lieutenant commander who at least knows how to speak the language of research and do some research, which right. was kind of funny because I didn't know that much about it but um that was a really interesting project so that was cool and then you know went over to um SOC pack special operations command pacific after that and did some work over there and basically retired after 20 years total in 2007 so uh, I'm sorry 2011 I retired as a commander which is an 05 right. uh, after 20 years of total service Wow, what an amazing career you had. And and one thing I neglected to mention that I think is an important part of your story is you weren't um, sort of raised to think you were going to go into special forces or even the military, right? You you came from a business background in your family. Yeah, I did. I was uh, business um, groomed for business. We have a family business that's been around for over 100 years, which is not that common. I think there's about 1,000 left in the United States. Wow. Uh, so Divine Brothers is the name. It's in upstate New York, Utica, New York. They make uh, m- you know manufacturing equipment for business, so industrial um, uh, mixers for like the cereal, cereal industry, uh, metal finishing machinery for like the auto industry, uh, buffing wheels and and stuff like that. Really interesting history. You know, the company was kind of enlisted in World War One to make army helmets. You know, for the doughboys. Right. Just cool stuff, and so my entire family lives up there and works there. And um, you know, when I went to college, I was kind of encouraged to get into business or some sort something that would be useful for business. I ended up uh, majoring in economics at Colgate University, and then um, as I was leaving Colgate, you know, I was kind of figuring out what I was going to do. The military wasn't anywhere in my consciousness at all. It was not something I, I even remotely considered. I decided to take a job. You know, down in New York with a big CPA firm, Coopers and Librand at the time, which is now Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Right. And so I, I end up going to NYU Stern School of Business, and I, I got my MBA there, and uh, with Coopers, and then I shifted to Arthur Anderson. Two years later, I got my CPA, so I became a certified public accountant. You know, uh, working down there for big financial services firms. And so uh, I kind of write a little bit about that. That whole period of time was a huge awakening for me. And I think just the, the huge disconnect I felt working in the business world and that financial community while simultaneously um, training in this martial art that I'd gotten into where I was doing a lot of introspection, a lot of meditation um, that, that really emphasized or um, magnified this sense that I was in a complete, you know, misconnected or misalignment, you know, situation in my life. And it really caused a deep period of introspection where uh, I ended up, you know, surfacing this notion that I was a warrior and that I was, you know, trying to, you know, put, wearing the wrong hat basically in society. And so I started to think about what, what, what could be the possibilities. I even looked at the Air Force to consider flying in the Air Force and for the Marine Corps, you know, poked around a place where I thought I could fulfill my kind of growing warrior ethos and warrior attitude. And I kept settling on the seals because I was really, uh, I was really an athlete and really, you know, kind of connected with that, that ground level truth of the, you know, right. of the space operator. So. Wow. So, that's a good, I think, a good lesson for all of us. If there's somebody out there who, you know, maybe you're raised in your family and you're supposed to follow your dad into his business or whatever, you've got to listen to your own heart, right? You got to follow right. your own path and right. be true to yourself. Really- yeah. Yeah, I really believe that. And for a lot of people, it's not easy, you know, because they truly don't know. They don't know what they don't know, you know, because they, they haven't taken the time. And so you ask them, what is it you really are meant to do in your life? And they give you a blank stare. And they say, well, I don't know. And it's not enough to just sit and, you know, with a pen and a pencil 
or a pen and a piece of paper and to start writing ideas out. I mean, you it takes time, right? You've got to sit right. in silence. You got to really, you got to really connect with your deeper sense of you know self, however you want to define that. You, you know, your spirit or your soul, and see what is that telling you. You know, what's the what's the message there? That's right. And once you know what's right for you, like you have to be true to yourself. You know, there's a Bible verse in, in James that says, "To him who knows what's right and doesn't do it, it's sin." So it's like if you're sinning against yourself, sort of, if you don't follow your heart, right? So interesting. I, yeah, no, I, I agree in, in a sense. Um, at least you never find fulfillment, right? That's right. You, know, you, you can get by in life, and you can have probably all the good things that you know materially that life has to offer. But um, like a lot of my students, and I'm sure a lot of the folks that you talk to, they um, they're left with a sense uh, when they start initially when I when I meet them, they left with this sense that something's missing, and they're not really quite sure what it is. And what's missing is just this deep sense of purpose and understanding about why they take every action they take every day. And I think that's really amazing. Like when if you can get up every day, and and know beyond a shadow of a doubt why you're doing everything that you got planned for that day as opposed to you know just getting up to to earn money you know or to play or whatever right um then life takes on a whole different you know color and different uh depth and uh becomes really interesting and really exciting and your passion just starts to light up and and you start to you know walk with your hair on fire because right. everything is really meaningful and and when the going gets tough you know this is like with with mental toughness training, which is one of our specialties, you know, kicks you in the balls, and you don't sh back down because you know why you're there to begin with. You know, when life rears its ugly head with a major with a major challenge, regardless of what it is, you know, you you face it down because you have a deep sense of certainty about why you're doing it to begin with. You know, and that's why, like military, most military folks are are so incredible and have such courage because they, they know why they're there. You know, they're serving freedom and, you know, they're out there putting their, their lives at risk because they deeply believe in this notion that America must be free and must be the beacon of freedom for the world. And only, you know, the only reason that that exists is because somebody has to be out there to defend those boundaries, right? To defend that idea. That's exactly right. You know, you talk a lot in your book, um, The Way of the Seal, about this idea of, of seeing in your mind the goal, the, the, the completion of your goal, and using, right. that, using that vision, that, that belief that you've already visualized to get there. Right. And to talk about how you, how you got through SEAL training using that kind of uh, mentality. Well, I, you know, it, it's funny. I had a little talk yesterday, and I was... I was um, I was telling these business people the same exact thing, and it's it's really pretty interesting when you think about it because you know it it goes just like we were talking about earlier that it's it's difficult for some people to spend the time to really go deep inside and to learn who they are, what's their purpose, and you know why they should go off and do you know maybe in a different direction, a more powerful direction. Um, they also can't lock on to a clear vision of what that is and so you know once you know so you, the work kind of has to come in this sequence you know you've got to get clear about you know you've got to be able to articulate in words what it is that you want that's and it's got to be powerful and it's got to be good right it's got to be meaningful to you right then you develop you have to develop this visual you know acute visual image of what that is you've got to be able to see it in its all of its form, as having already been, you know, completed or accomplished. You know, it's like an architect. An architect, you know, will have an idea, but then he'll sit and, and he'll work on the vision until he can see clearly in his mind what that building looks like, and only then will he draft it on the paper, right? That's so right. you architect your life this way. And so back when I was, um, I was in New York. I was very, very fortunate to. Um, have a an opportunity to practice and train visualization in my martial arts. Now, the martial arts guy Tadashi Nakamura is an amazing grandmaster. He did not teach me visualization. What I I learned visualization from my swim coach in college. You know, more through experience. He had me visualizing you know my my uh, event in my head and timing it. And so I learned how to do that on my own, right? Because it's very hard to like take a course in visualization. Right, right. So it's really experiential. 
Um, I mean, there we teach a lot of tips and we get people training with it in Unbeatable Mind and my Skill Fit program. But you know, you got to do the work, and nobody else can like grade you, right? Right, right. We don't. I can't hook a device yet up to your mind and see how <laughs> how good you're doing. You know what I mean? Right. So, anyways, but I I just so happened to have developed a pretty good visual acuity through because I practiced it. You know, it's just like learning a language. If you don't practice it, you're going to suck. That's if you don't right. practice your visualization, you're going to suck. So I forced myself to practice it when I was in the swim program at Colgate until I got good enough at least to finish an eight-length race, which took, you know, three or four minutes. And so then when I was um, sitting on my, my meditation bench in Sado Karate and trying to quiet my mind doing the, the classic Zen meditation, which is just breathing in and counting, trying to get to a count of ten, Simple as that. It's a concentration meditation technique. Um, in order to c- calm my mind, I would visualize myself with. I had two two that I worked with. One was a windshield wiper. I visualized myself like uh, my mind was a windshield, and the rain hitting it, the stormy rain hitting it, were my thoughts. And then I had a windshield wiper that would just wipe away those thoughts in the rain, and eventually it would just clear it. And when I, when the window when the windshield was clear from the wiper, my mind was clear. It was fascinating, wow. and so I used visualization to to help deepen the meditation. Another another one I used was called fish bowl, and that was really cool. I won't go into description there, but uh, so I had a few of these. So it was really cool. So I'm leading back to your question here. So um, through about I was in New York for four years. About halfway through. I had started the martial arts program right at the beginning of my my uh, sojourn in New York. I mean, I literally got there, started going to NYU, started working, walked home. You know, two weeks into it, I walked home one night, and and on 23rd Street and Broadway, I heard all these shouts coming from the second story building, and I saw the sign as it's Sado Karate. I walked in. That was a huge turning point in my life because I stepped into the life of my first mentor, Nakamura. He was the one that had me, you know, sitting on the meditation bench every day and for long periods on Thursdays and going to the Zen Mountain Monastery to do these weekend retreats where we trained hard on the on the field and then we came in and sat with the monks. It was amazing. Really amazing. Changed my life because it, it changed my mind. Right. I mean, I don't like changing an idea. I mean, it literally changed the structure of my mind and how I use my mind. It was my first attempt to really train my mind. So through this process is how I decided that I was a misfit, like I talked about earlier, as a CPA, and that I was meant to be a warrior. Now, that was kind of a decision. That was just the decision point. That was an inflection point. Once I made the decision, then I looked at it and said, okay, I, if I'm going to be a Navy SEAL, the recruiters are set, basically say I don't stand a snowball's chance in hell, you know, because as a civilian, without coming through the Naval Academy or ROTC, you know, I'd have to go through officer candidate school, you know maybe two people a year, right? So statistically, it's not good. And so I said, well, I've got to leverage all the skills that I've ever learned in my life. And I was only 23, so it wasn't, you know, like a long life. But the most important skill that I could think about was the meditate or the visualization. So what I did is I, um, there was one video that I could find of the SEALs, a recruiting video called Be Someone Special. I watched that 20 or 30 times, maybe more. And then I, so I had this good image in my mind of what SEAL training was like. And then I inserted myself into that image in my mind's eye. And then every day when I did my training, I did my martial arts training and my functional fitness training and my running and you know swimming, I would spend time in my mind going back and replaying the video of me going through SEAL training, being a SEAL, you know, until you know, I felt like I'd, I'd done, so maybe 10 minutes every day. And I did that for nine months at least. And this is well before I even had a nod from the recruiter that I was going to get in. In fact, he was telling me, probably not going to happen, don't get your hopes up, blah, 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 blah. So, Lee, what was really cool, and I'll kind of uh, kind of end this part of the story here, is that about three-quarters of the way through me doing this, I had this, like, shift, this real subtle shift inside of me. And... Um, it's like when you go from um, wondering about something to knowing something with a deep sense of certainty. Right. Like, let's say like you're in a relationship and you're wondering, hey, could this person be the one? And all of a sudden one day you wake up and you're like, holy shit, I couldn't live my life without That's this right. person. Right? It, right? it kind of felt the same way. I went from this sense of I'm, I want to be a SEAL, I'm training to be a SEAL, to all of a sudden I knew I was going to be a SEAL. I knew it. 
And I attribute it to the visualization because I was practicing, 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 practicing in my mind so much that my subconscious and my, my whole being was kind of uh, accepting this new reality that I was going to be a SEAL until one day I literally had the sense that I have already done it. I've already won it. Right? And I, I call that, when I train people, I call that winning in your mind before right. you step into the arena. So I'd won in my mind. And sure enough, you know, when I, when I feel like uh, three weeks later or so, the recruiter called me and he's like, Mark, you got in. Congratulations. I was like, you know, that does not surprise me. I knew you that. Right. <laughs> yeah. I knew that. Yeah. And then I, when I went to Bud's, I had this amazing, I'd never been in California before. Of course, never been to the Bud's compound, but I had this sense that I had been there before. And when the instructors started their games, I had the sense that I've done this before. And so every day I just showed up with a big ass smile on my face. I'm like, this is awesome. You know what I mean? They'd have to literally kill me to get me to quit. I've already won this. And that attitude and, of course, you know, showing up every day and putting out and being a good teammate and being a good leader, you know, led to me um, being the honor man of my class, which is number one grad. And it was such a powerful lesson that I came back years later to try to teach a lot of the principles that I'd learned to uh, spec ops candidates. So that's what I've been doing, you know, since 2007, basically. Wow. Now, just you said this in passing, Mark, but folks, he, he has a lot of humility for a, such an accomplished man. But how, you, you said you finished number one in your class, but how many people started that class? Uh, my class, we had 180 start. And how many finished? 19. 19 finished, right. So yeah. 180 started, 19 finished. He's number one, folks. That's what we call a man's man uh, in, in Auburn, <laughs> Alabama, anyway. So I, I appreciate the uh, the humility, but your story is amazing. And, and I'm going to bring it back around to you know my world as a brain surgeon and a person interested in neurochemistry. And the whole, you may not know this, Mark, but the whole reason I started this this you start today concept is that my wife and I and our family we lost a child last year, and, oh, and we rallied uh, as a family after that horrible thing when our son passed away, and we realized that you know you, you're not promised tomorrow, and you right. can't you can't wait to have the relationships the way you want them. You can't wait to right. accomplish the things you feel like you're on this planet for, right. and you have to start today because tomorrow's a lie, right? You, you don't know what tomorrow's like, but you know you have today. Oh, Right. So right. what we know now from brain chemistry is the things you were talking about in visualization are that when if you've ever read Daniel Amen's book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, the mm -hmm. idea is, you, and we know it from MRI studies even done here at Auburn now, that if you think about things positively, it changes your brain chemistry. It, it changes right. your reality. It changes how your, your mind functions. And I think that's what your life's been about on the ground. You know, right. uh, up in the ivory tower, the researchers are proving the point that you guys and your mentors uh, back in, in, as you mentioned, your uh, your martial arts mentor, they've known it for thousands of years that if you think yeah, about, right. you think about things properly, then you you can change your own reality. So that, that's an amazing right. story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yeah. Talk to me for a minute. You know, Monday is is Memorial Day. Um, right. Folks listening, this is probably happening on Monday for you. Um, as a serviceman, as a person who's stepped up and answered the call and volunteered to serve your country, talk to me for a minute about what it's like to be at war. And I've shared my own war stories with my listeners, so I'm just going to let you tell yours. Um, tell us what it's like to be at war and be around people who are putting their lives on the line, what it's like to lose somebody you care about, what Memorial Day means to you. Yeah, it's, um, it's such a great question. Um, you know, war is brings out the best and the worst in humanity, and it, I think for warriors it brings out the best. Right? For evil people, it brings out the worst. That's right. Um, when I go to when I went to war in Iraq with um, the SEALs, and you know, we worked with a lot of Army and Air Force and Marines and well, unbelievable human beings, men and women. Um, it, it was really an extraordinary experience. I mean, we're far, far away from home. It was. You know, I'm not going to say it was lonely, but the 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 intensity of missing the family because you're so in such a dangerous situation was um, was really hard to deal with, right? And and that was one of the hardest things I think that the service people and and um, my my teammates had to deal with is that day, you know every day you're sitting there going it could be my last, and so you know just getting that one extra phone call in to your family or being able to you know today it's amazing to being able to Skype home and 
and tuck your kids in is extraordinary. That, I didn't really have that opportunity in, in 04, although there were, we, at least we had internet. Now, folks earlier than that didn't have anything, you know what I mean? And so a letter was, you know, all you had, and sometimes that didn't arrive until too late. So that, that was extraordinary, and to see the, um, the courage, right? Now, I, I remember flying into Baghdad. Now, I came in as a reserve officer. You know, I hadn't sighted my weapon. I hadn't touched my gear. I had all brand new gear. Because, again, I had been off active duty for, you know, a, a few years, like s- seven or eight years. And so I didn't have my, my normal, you know, there were, let me put it this way. When I was in active duty with my team around me and we're training every day, I mean, we were, we were invincible, right? We, right? we were indomitable. But you, you step out of that team and then you become a sole practitioner, like a reservist, you know, like I was flying in with people I didn't know and I was going to get met at the airport in Baghdad and then they were going to take me back to the talk. And, you know, once I was at the talk, it was going to be you know, fine. And then I have, I have my new team and I'll plug, plug into them. And that's what happened. But I remember flying into Baghdad on a C-130 and I was literally just, you know, I was scared because I hadn't been in a combat zone and, you know, I had um, didn't have my team around me. I hadn't been training, you know. Right. And uh, and I remember doing some yoga on the C-130 to try to calm myself down. And, and there were a couple other guys in the plane. One of them was a Marine general with his, like, aide. And they kind of eyeballed me a little bit funny. You know, who's, who's this Navy SEAL, you know, who's obviously scared shitless. And they're just sitting there working on a PowerPoint, you know. Right. <laughs> you know, so it was really interesting. But once I got on the ground um, and I saw how calm, you know, my, my teammates were, you know, having been in the combat zone for weeks or months, um, you know, mortars are coming in and they're just acting like it's no big deal. You know, we just kind of get out of the danger zone. Here we go. And I'm like, it took me a little bit to get used to that. But once I got used to it, um, I really, I got it, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, in a combat zone, you you can't, you know, you can't cringe with fear. You can't back down. You can't hunker down or hide. You know, you've got to just keep moving forward. And we have this saying, you know, in, in our training that doubt can uh, doubt can be ended by action alone. That's right. right. Doubt can be ended by action alone. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're act, we're busy, we're going after the enemy, we're taking it to them. And by that action, you know, very few SEALs were ever wounded or killed in combat. Now, we had SEALs killed with accidents. We had SEALs who were killed in Afghanistan when they're... You know, when their helicopter was shot down with an RPG, which is a huge disaster for us. We had SEALs killed in Afghanistan on the rescue mission for Marcus Luttrell. Mm-hmm. Again, you know, shot down. But it was very rare for a SEAL to get killed on a mission that they were going out when hunting the bad guys. Because we were, we were so aggressive and action-oriented that we were always, you know, always many, many steps ahead of the enemy. And most of the American services are like that because we're so good at what we do. The professionalism is so incredible, the training is so incredible, and our interoperability is so incredible that you know it, it's just a random act of violence that that usually takes out an American these days. And that's that's a huge, obviously, misfortune when that happens, and it's hard to hard to witness. But um, I remember one of the special ops guys that I was working with. You know, he's a super gr- cool guy, and he had a uh, a young uh, daughter, I think, and um, neat guy. You know, he's just like me. He's about he was about thirty five at the time, and he went out to one of his forward operating bases to to meet with some of his Green Berets, and he's walking across the compound, and a freaking RPG literally just r- runs into him, or he runs into it. You know what I mean? It, pro- it wasn't even intended for him. He was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and you know. It's just really sad when that happens. I'm no, I'm kind of rambling here, but telling you my experiences were, um, you know, unbelievably amazing to see the, you know, the spirit of the military men and women and their courage um, under fire and their courage to be able to to be over there for six, nine, even sometimes even longer. I remember on my my way over to Iraq, I met a guy who was a um, a National Guard guy, and this guy, you know, the National Guard in some cases really took it up the shorts right they did and this guy had been deployed for like 18 months i couldn't believe it when he told me how long i don't know if I remember if it was 12 or 8 i'm pretty sure it was like 18 it was longer than i had ever longer than a year let's put it that yeah. way and i'm like holy cow you must be super burnt out he's like yeah i am my business is gone my mm-hmm. my wife is about to ditch me 
And so this guy served his country for that long in Iraq. And because he was gone for so long, you know, he lost his business and he had to come back and you know, start over. I met another guy at one of our training who was a surgeon also, kind of like you. He's an army surgeon. And, um, you know, he had lost his practice because when he went and he deployed and do it, did his thing, when he came back, his partners had basically written him off and said, listen, you're not here for us. We're doing all the work. And so they elbowed him out of his partnership and he ended up in this big legal battle. And he, you know, he was devastated because he's over there. You know, first of all, he's seeing things he'd never seen because he, you know, back home he wasn't a trauma surgeon. Over right. there, everybody's a trauma surgeon. That's right. As, oh, and so he's seeing, you know, dealing with limbs blown off and you know, you know, real acute trauma. And he comes home, <laughs> and he doesn't have his practice anymore, and he's locked in this legal battle. I mean, those stories are so incredible, and I think it's a real, um, you know, people don't realize the sacrifice that especially the reservists and the National Guardmen went through during Iraq and Afghanistan. It's incredible, right? That yes. sacrifice. I wish those were uncommon stories, you know, but they're not. The, the reservists yeah. and the Guardsmen that were deployed just over and over and over in the early part of the war. Um, I knew a neurosurgeon who was in Baghdad for 15 months in a row, you know, besides this two-week break. Um, I, I was fortunate that the Air Force leadership, um, because we were going to Balad, which at the time was, you know, as you know, like basically a big mortar pit. You were shot at every day. And, and so they didn't keep us in theater very long because the burnout was so bad. You know, we, we, right. it was just 24-7 work. And so I, I didn't personally experience that. But, I mean, in my own life, I mean, I, I went through a divorce. And, and a lot of things happened to me as a result of uh, some of the things I've been through. Um, and so, yeah, Memorial Day coming up is a time when civilians really ought to maybe take stock of the folks that are out there and have have been throughout history out there doing right. the work that that nobody else can do right i mean you you guys especially y'all are out um doing the stuff that the big army can't do and when, when somebody right. in the world needs to be taken care of the navy seals take care of them right right but it's a huge team effort you know and, and all seals will acknowledge that we you know we're the pointy edge of the spear but behind us is the long staff right? That's right and you know so the rest of the military provides that staff and that support and you know like i i was um i love to, to reference the bin laden raid now my my seal team three commanding officer mccraven uh is one of my sea daddies a great guy and i work with him again at, at spec war group one and he, you know, had a meteoritic career and went on to be, uh, you know, to Devgru, and then he wanted to J JSOC is the unit that actually was hunting Bin Laden, um, and so he was deputy of JSOC, and then he went and did something else, and then he came back as commander of JSOC. So all that time he was hunting Bin Laden, they never got him, and then he went off and did something else, got promoted, promoted, promoted. And the next thing you know, he's four star admiral in charge of SOCOM, and he reinvigorates the hunt. Now, granted, they were hunting all along, but it was him and his commitment. To nailing bin Laden that kept the flashlight turned on that mission because there were a lot of people saying that he had died you know that he right. he was on dialysis there's no way he could have survived that long right. and so the whole institution was ready to kind of you know take their eye off the ball and uh, of course President Obama wanted to get him so he probably backed this whole initiative so McRaven reinvigorated it and, and they went and nailed bin Laden but you know if I said hey Admiral McRaven, I'd like to give you credit for this mission. He'd be like, no, no, please don't do that because this is a massive team effort, massive team effort. You know what I mean? That's right. And so the SEALs went in the door, but, you know, they had to get there with the pilots and they had the intel operators and they had, you know, all the support mechanisms and, you know, all the all the people that have laid down their lives, you know, to in the service of getting us to where we could even do something like that over the years. It's incredible. It is incredible, and we serve in an incredible country, and, you know, people like you, um, I think the civilians out there would just owe you a big debt of gratitude. You know, I was I was a medic in the in the rear. If you, something bad happened to you guys, I was there, and we were there, but, um, boy, the bravery and courage that you guys have to go out and, and take care of business, I, I just, I, I thank you, and I salute you, sir, uh, for what you've done on all of our behalf, and you know, 1.3, in excess of 1.3 million Americans have died in battle in our nation's history. Um, and, and what does that mean to you? I mean, 1.3 million men and women. I mean. That's incredible. I mean, it's it's extraordinary. Um, I think everyone um, should consider that those people, right, served us in the name of freedom, and uh, that you know, I I just wrote a little blog post about this, but the you know it caught my attention. The Navy's uh, recruiting ad 
uh, during the X Games was uh, we're a global force for good. I don't know if they normally do that because it, I, don't, I don't watch TV, but it struck me that the entire U.S. military is a global force for good. Now I know there's a lot of a lot of people in you know with certain political leanings who will you know attack that and say that you know the military is maybe not you know in the um, not a good force or whatever you know it's not a global force for good or you know a necessary evil but i i disagree i think you know the the men and women who have given their lives and who consider continue to serve would 100 percent agree that we are a global force for good and what i mean by that we we are the vanguard protecting and preserving and pressing the boundaries of freedom you know um <clears throat> after world war ii I don't know the, the stats, but the number of free countries in the world was like 20 or 30. That's right. Uh, and now it's in the hundreds. And were it not for the U.S. military and our allies out there, you know, with a persistent presence, deterring evil, you know, pushing back communism, eventually defeating, you know, the, the Soviet threat during, you know, the Cold War, um, you know, and, and now even our most recent experiments with democracy building in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, and, you know, you could you, history will be the judge, right? History will be the right. judge. A lot of what's happening over there is is not necessarily the result of the American military involvement, but the result of technology, diffusion of uh, social networks and Twitter, and a very restless population that isn't getting their needs met, right? That's right. And so, and so maybe we shifted the balance of power between Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia and Iraq and all these things, but. The reality is, it's not our fault that the place is flying apart at the seams. You know what I mean? It's it's the nature it's the it's the nature of what's happening with um, technology and instant communications. And you've got um, you've got literally billions of people coming online within within five years. The practically an entire global population will be able to connect with each other with a mobile device that will practically be free. That's right. Or will will be free for those in the third world. And we'll have persistent high speed, high bandwidth internet connection around the globe. So you can use your iPhone in the Gobi Desert. And that's just an incredible sea change of of what it means to be human. And so the the nature of how humans organize is changing. That's right. And I have the sense that that uh, large, rigid, um, you know, organizations, including countries, are starting to change and shift and break down. That's why we're going to see a lot of chaos, a lot of conflict. And the U.S. military is absolutely going to be necessary, and it's going to be looked at more and more by the world as the global force for good that it truly is. Because we're going to be there when the disasters strike. We're going to be there you know, to help find 300 schoolgirls who've been kidnapped in Africa. Who else is going to send in troops? That's right. Nobody. And so we've got to do that. We've got to step up. When the tsunami hits and, you know, the entire coastline of Japan is destroyed again, we're going to be there. We're going to help out with our floating right. cities. And so it's just incredible. And, and a lot of people have lost their lives to allow for this capacity for the United States and our allies to be this global force for good that can protect and preserve some semblance of global order so that we can live and, you know, the rest of us can live in this unbelievable abundance and prosperity, an abundance that is going to grow and expand. And then if we could get out of our negativity, we'll all be able to tap into this and, you know, have this unbelievable, you know, life ahead of us. But, um, you know, there's going to be chaos and change, you know, in, in the process. And the U.S. military is there. The sheepdogs are there to preserve and protect that freedom. Wow, that is so eloquently put. And you can tell, folks, that, that Commander Devine is very passionate about this, as I am. And, and I'll tell you the truth. You're right. There's not another probably military in the world that would that is routinely called upon when disaster strikes. I, I've watched with my own eyeballs an American private roll up his sleeves and donate blood to the terrorists that set off the bomb that brought him into the hospital. You know, nobody does that, but American, no, but, Americans do, know, right? The other thing, Lee, is even if they could, I'm not sure they would. I mean, so Russia and China have big militaries, but they're not responding the way we do. They don't respond with the human spirit of freedom to uh, others in need, even if they're the enemy. You know what I mean? It's just not common. They have not learned that. That that is a an unbelievably rich and um, 
a precious gift that the Americans have been given with this, this sense of that we're free. We don't want to be controlled by a heavy-handed institution, right? We don't want it. That, that's that's right. one of the reasons why you know politics in our country is so so intense right now. Is like many people don't want bigger government, don't want that heavy hand. And then there's you know there's a growing number of people who say I I need it because they've been bred that. Well, you know those of us who've been bred with freedom and bred to to try to figure it out on our own. We we are the creators. We're the you know creating the future. Entrepreneurs, you know and and military men and women, we're creating the prosperity, and we don't want it. We want to push back against that, you know, that intense control and centralization. And technology is pushing back against it, right? Like I said, exactly you know, the, right. the fusion of technology and now the convergence of ro robotics and AI and uh, you know, genome uh, projects and three. D printing, oh my God, and, and the internet, and cloud. Right. I mean, it's it's literally changing. And a lot of the, you know, the bureaucratic institutions stand as prison guards. So, like the FDA, for example, a lot of the most unbelievable advances, which are going to be able to, you know, mean that the human being can stay healthy through their natural lifespan without having to deal with all these crazy diseases. Well, they're not able to deploy them in the United States because it costs a billion dollars to get a drug to market. That's, That's right. a broken model. Now, the same drug is being used overseas. You know, 30 million people in France or, or Europe have been using it with great effect. So why can't you just count those 30 million people as a human study, right? They're humans. You know, the FDA is just, you know, so broken. And the VA is obviously so broken. And all these old institutions are broken. And so these entrepreneurs like Elon Musk and all these guys who are creating um, unbelievable technologies are now deploying them right. out of the country. They're deploying them in Africa and in other areas where the where they don't have this intense prison guard regulatory system. And so in a lot of ways, you know, it's possible to look at them as leapfrogging us in technology, but it's also good because, you know, the, these, these people are in greater need. But, you know, you could look out 10 years and a lot of the most incredible technological advances will be available outside of the United States and not in it. So it's, it's interesting juxtaposition. You know, we have this amazing military developing all these technologies, protecting freedom, and yet we have these really, really rigid bureaucratic systems resisting change that are you know, fighting against freedom within our own country. It's a fascinating you know, discussion, actually. But I know I'm veering a little bit from the Memorial Day. So. Hey, it's okay, you know, because the whole point of this whole thing is that it, because we're Americans, we're allowed to talk about whatever we want to talk about, right? Hallelujah. And, and, and we can defend freedom and we can fight for it. And guys like you are out there doing it. And, and you know, j just bring it home real quick. I want you to tell us um, that there's probably some listeners that don't know what seal fit is and they haven't yet read your book, The Way of the Seal. So give us a, a short sure. little introduction to what you're doing these days. Okay. Uh, in 2007, I got hired by the recruiting command of the Navy to, to mentor Navy SEAL candidates. And um, it was an incredible program. We had 36 uh, former SEALs out around the country and we're mentoring the, the candidates who were going to boot camp. Well, I was only able to hold on to that contract for a year. I didn't know anything about government contracting. A little company called Blackwater USA came in and snaked it away from me, uh, which was a huge loss. But, uh, you know, putting my SEAL face on, I literally just picked up, dusted myself off and said, okay, what am I, what am I going to do? I really love this idea of mentoring and training. I'm really good at it. Um, and then I thought, well, you know what? The Navy didn't even allow me to do what I wanted to do, which was to teach mental toughness and bring some of what I learned in the martial arts into it and to leverage new cutting-edge fitness models like CrossFit. So I said, okay, I'm going to experiment with this, and I'm going to develop a, a program where I can integrate best practices from east and west, and I'm going to train spec ops candidates on my own. And so I'll have thousands of clients instead of one, and that – that idea was the birth of SealFit. So in 2007, I launched um, a CrossFit affiliate in my hometown of Encinitas, California. Launched my first SealFit program, which was a 50-hour nonstop training camp called Kokoro Camp. Kokoro is a Japanese word, which means to merge your heart and your mind and your actions. And, uh, and then SealFit just kind of started to grow from there. And so SealFit is an integrated training for warrior development, functional fitness, mental toughness, right? And so we, we train what I call the five mountains, physical, mental, emotional, intuitional, and spiritual strength. And we do it through this, this integrated model where we, we use the physical training to bridge to mental toughness, to bridge to the intuition and the emotions and, 
in the spirit. And so it becomes very dynamic. And so we have live-in academies, three days, five days, three weeks. We have that 50-hour immersion I talked about. And now we're starting to do these 20X challenge events, which are 12-hour events out around the country. And then also we're working with sports teams. Like I'll be going down to your neck of the woods in June, University of South Alabama, yeah. to do a to do an event with them for teaching them mental toughness, teaching the coaches how to train mental toughness, and then putting them through a little crucible, you know, six hour experience with the athletes. So that's that's what Seal Fit is. It's amazing. Now, what I in our immersion academies, when people come and live with me on site at my training center, um, we train from five in the morning till sometimes eight or nine at night. Now, obviously, I can't physically beat you up for that long and so I, half of that time at least a good chunk of it is is the other four mountains you know i'm doing lectures on mental toughness and leadership i'm doing uh we do warrior yoga which is a yoga program i developed for them which develops uh, awareness and the breath we do breathing training uh we do meditation and concentration training uh we do energy work with some qigong exercises that i pull in um Obviously, we do a lot of mental toughness through teamwork, like log PT and team drills, and it becomes just extremely dynamic in this kind of ebb and flow and yin and yang of training, and the, the uh, breakthroughs are incredible, right? People, this is the first time they've trained in this immersive capacity where they're training all their senses, physically, mentally, emotionally, intuitionally, and they have just radical breakthroughs. So that was what I wanted. I wanted to try to capture that part of it in the way of the seal, the book. So I wrote that, you know, for leaders, and I introduced these principles of, you know, how did how do you develop, you know, the the warrior's mind and apply it to business leadership. And the book has been really well received. I mean, you know, you you're, you know, it's like I'm, op, you know, cautiously optimistic that the book will can be one of those books that you know, gain speed over time because I continue to get people saying, boy, if I, I could buy a whole box of these and, and give it out to my company and people are buying multiple copies and sharing them because they're finding it so useful in their own lives. And it's just chock full. It's like a training program for, for life uh, using this integrated development model that I've developed. And it's, it's super cool, super powerful. It really is. You know, folks, it's a great book. And I, I've said before, uh, you know, it, We've got a New York Times list that's full of books, and a lot of those books are, you know, they're good, but they're not life-changing kind of books. They're not, you know, Fifty Shades of Whatever is not going to change your life, but Mark Devine's book will. Um, so as soon as you finish reading No Place to Hide, my book, right. and pick up Mark's book. Um, I, I, I've spent some time with it and now with him, and, and boy, he, he's a leader. Uh, he's a mentor. He's he's walked the walk and not just talked the talk. And and you can learn a lot from this man. Um, Mark, I, I don't know what else that we could talk about. I, I feel like I could talk to you all day long. But give me a, a parting shot. Like if you want to tell my listeners something from your life, your message, your mission that will that will impact them the most, especially on Memorial Day. What do you have to say uh, in parting for my folks out there on You Start Today? Okay, what I, what I would say um, is if you want to honor honor those who served and given up their lives, then honor them by getting your shit together and stepping up and um, trying to do better starting today. And what I mean by that is take your, take your life seriously. Like uh, Lee said, today could be the last day. Tomorrow, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't exist. Yesterday is just a distant memory. So... Uh, one day, one life, as my uh, grandmaster Nakamura used to say, one day, one life, meaning you've got a lifetime today. So go live it. Go live it with your hair on fire. You know, make sure that you're doing the right things. You're not fritting your time away. Get control of your body and your mind and take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. And you know, my message is that the way you do that is you start to, to train your body and your mind and your emotions. And so you elevate this idea of training, meaning you, you've got the capacity to do great things, but you're not going to do it unless you train, right? Your body will, will atrophy unless you train it. Your mind will atrophy and be weak unless you train it. Your emotional life and development will be soft and weak unless you train it. And so the way you step up and get uh, better, even just a 1% better every day so that you can uh, serve others better is to elevate this idea of training 
yourself to the same level as eating and sleeping. And so you should, I don't care if it's 15 minutes, you should spend 15 minutes in some sort of training practice every day, whether it's a functional movement or meditation or breathing or contemplation. And 15 minutes, by, frankly, is not enough. You know, you really, everybody can afford an hour a day to work on themselves. And when you start to work on yourself every day, that's when the magic happens. And that's how you can honor those million and a half men or so who've, you know, served and died in our service of freedom. Wow. Commander Mark Devine, thank you so much for being with us. I salute you, sir. Um, look forward to shaking your hand in real life someday. And if you're, when you're in Alabama, uh, come yeah. up here and uh, we'll feed you something good and, and uh, you can work us out. So. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you very much, Lee, and happy Memorial Day, everybody. Hoo-yah. Special thanks to Chris Brogan, www.chrisbrogan.com, for arranging this interview between me and Mark Devine. Be sure to check out Chris's latest book, The Freak Shall Inherit the Earth, Entrepreneurship for Weirdos, Misfits, and World Dominators by Chris Brogan. You can find out more about Mark Devine at www.sealfit.com, and his latest national bestseller is The Way of the Seal, Think Like an Elite Warrior to Lead and Succeed. My book, No Place to Hide, A Brain Surgeon's Long Journey Home from the Iraq War, is available everywhere books are sold. And you can find it on my website, wleewarrenmd.com backslash npth. If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to check out the You Start Today Real Life Change with Dr. Lee Warren podcast. Because remember, if you want to become healthier, feel better, and be happier, you start today. That was awesome. You have a good radio voice. You like me?